blood and gore surrounded the whole of the 1860s and the 1870s as the U.S. was building itself back after the bloodiest war in U.S. history. Blood and gore was the fire that brought us into the society we have now. The frontier towns are booming and the economy was growing. The railroads were bringing out immigrants from the East Coast to start their lives and some looking to enrich their lives with farmland. They were moving west, and as they traveled, they would hear tales of what awaited them. Tales of robbery, outlaws, and sometimes profit. After the horror that just ended five years earlier, some settlers and immigrants were about to go from the frying pan and into the freezer as they would meet what I like to call the Adams family on meth, the Benders. I didn't see you there. Something big is going on here. From hunting ghosts to Bigfoot. Paranormal, UFOs, true crime, and more. We won't just be spouting articles. I was researching for your entertainment. The beginning of a new world. The best guac you'll ever fucking eat. True story. It's basically like one day you walk outside and you see that the ants are playing with matches. This, this is, is the Black Cat Report. See you on the other side. Welcome to the Black Cat Report in episode 65. I'm Joey, your host for today, and joining with me is Gil. Hello, hello, hello. And sadly, Betsabe is still on her journey and should be back next week. Now, we know we have been at it for a bit with UFO stories, well, because they have been in the news so much, and we have been finding so much information on UFOs lately. We have some news that we will announce in the coming weeks about some plans we have for some of it. We wanted to get back to an old standby. Well, at least some of my favorite stuff mixed together. I wanted to get back into some old frontier history. And well, it wouldn't fit with us if it weren't for a little murder mixed in. This week, we're going to delve into the American frontier serial killer family, the Benders. Is this is this where I air horn? <laughs> yeah, yeah, this is where you air horn. Uh, I just want to say, don't get Ben out of shape this week. So, oh, my God. Uh, <laughs> I had to say it right off because uh, you know me. I'm Ben out of shape because we're recording this at 9 in the morning on a Sunday. <laughs> perfect. This is the perfect time to do it. Honestly, I wish we could have done it at night, but maybe you guys will listen to it at night. So we'll see. Yeah. 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 So I actually wrote this script at night, so it was even more fun for me to, to listen and read these while I was... Uh, while I was writing it, so that was fun. Yeah, so you also knew that like, there's no way in hell you could actually record this at night because of how fucked up it's about to be. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. that makes sense. Uh, I'm, I'm, that make, I'm there, I'm there, I'm with you. Okay. Yeah. 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 So, the Benders were a family of serial killers who committed a series of murders in Southeast Kansas that at a time caught the attention of everyone in the United States. One thing to know about me is I love a good story of an outlaw or outlaws defying the government and living a life on the run. I mean, who who doesn't freaking love outlaws? Especially frontier outlaws. They're so cool. Most of them. I just love the fact that there's a family of serial killers. Yeah, so it's really, really that, crazy. That's just normally like a presidential family. Like, uh, yes, yes, Normally yes, we true. elect those folks to office. Yeah, they're not called serial killers. They're just called politicians. Well, yeah, Boom. when you're when you're elected Boom. to office and you're yeah. a serial killer, it's just you're just a politician. Yeah, exactly. It makes yeah. it easier for us to be okay with it. We have to give them a spot in society. Exactly. So, they make great stories, outlaws do. And honestly, they sometimes do awesome things. But this family, they weren't just outlaws trying to make a name for themselves. They're straight up, of course, like we said earlier, serial killers. And to say... That it was not just like one person, like you just said earlier, like uh-huh. say a Ted Bundy or an Ed Kemper. It was a whole family of them, and just gives me nightmares. <laughs> or an the Ed, Benders were, or yeah. an Ed Bundy or a Ted Kemper. Wait, yeah. Ed Kemper, Ted, wait, Ed Ted, Kemper, Ted, Ted Bundy, Bundy, or Ed Kemper. Ed Kemper. <laughs> it's very hard to say, isn't it? <laughs> the Benders were a family of four okay. who had come to terrify and terrorize their victims. And now they will come to terrify my brain with nightmares and almost pee my pants just maybe a little bit. <laughs> I'm worried about all these protein shakes you're drinking, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I know, right? Yeah. I, I know, I know. And this protein uh, Greek yogurt that I'm, drink- I'm I drinking. I didn't even know they made right protein now. water. Like, how did you get that? <laughs> there is protein water nowadays. It's like, pretty crazy. Jesus Christ. It's called Prodder. Your poor um, kidneys. Yep. Well, now that I've revealed that, 
Let's get into their story. So we're going to go way back when. Way back when, before you could even, before most of us were born. Probably most before our grandparents were born, listening to this. Way back when. In October of 1870, John Gephardt, and what was thought of as his father, an older man named John Bender Sr., which he also becomes known as Pa Bender, rode into Labette County, Kansas, which was near Cherryville, which if you don't have any reference of Kansas, I it's don't. literally halfway in between Springfield, Missouri and Wichita, Kansas, which I know probably doesn't help you, <laughs> but it's the southeast <laughs> corner of Kansas. So that makes it easier, right? It's within the continental United States. Yes. So Kansas has like, okay, so if, if you, let's explain this first. Kansas has like one side of it pretty much that has everything and the other side has nothing. So, so basically, you got Hayes. Don't we just have the side with Taylor Swift now? Yeah, I'm that's pretty Kansas sure. City. Yeah, okay, that's yeah. Kansas City, which is crazy because Kansas City is also half in between uh, Missouri and Kansas. So tell me more about Taylor Swift because I this. The... We're not going to go into that. I've heard enough on local sports talk radio about Taylor Swift and Travis Kelsey. Everybody's talked about it. We all know it's people have beaten a dead horse. And, you know, so we all know about it. I know if Betsy Bay were here, she'd be one to, to talk about it. And, you know, I know just... more about that than I do Kansas's geography. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. As okay. you should. As you should. Yeah. Yeah. Fair. Okay. So <laughs> they came to Kansas. They were looking for a home. So they talked to the local trade store owner about inquiring some land for themselves. Uh -huh. Labette County had just been founded on May 6th, 1873. So not, not that long ago. So there was plenty of land ripe for the picking out there. Okay. The Homestead Act, which was passed on 1862 during the Civil War, so about halfway in between the start and the end of the Civil War. Gave people an opportunity to buy 160 acres of land provided they could abide by three stipulations, right? Mm -hmm. So I am going into the backstory of this because it kind of helps you understand where we're coming, where they're coming from, and the lay of the land. Okay. So, which always helps you get involved with a story like this. Yeah. Yeah. So one, they could not have taken up arms against the United States government, meaning... They either fought for the Union or they didn't fight at all. So they didn't fight for the Confederacy. all. Basically. Three quarters of the county can't can't do this now. Well, Kansas was actually a Union. Uh, yeah. So they didn't want to be. Yeah. Well, there was a big fight. So <laughs> there was a huge war in that part to fight before the Civil War started. And mm -hmm. there's a lot of history in this. Yeah. That, they want, that part of it wanted to be part of the Union, non-slave, mm -hmm. and other part wanted to be bloody Kansas is what they called it. Yeah. So- uh, we were not going to go into the backstory of that because that's a whole nother historical thing. So they weren't allowed to raise arms, or they weren't allowed to have had a history of raising arms against it, the U.S. government. Against the U.S. government, correct, yes. So they couldn't have been outlaws either, which kind of makes another part of it. Okay. Um, two, they must prove that they lived on and improved the land in two years' time. Easy, okay. right? If you're going to live there, you're going to improve it. You're going to put up a house. You're going to put up you know, barns, stalls <laughs> for your farmland. And 160 acres... I don't people. I hope people understand that that is a huge swath of land. You know, yeah. like that's a lot. I don't know if most of you probably live on a acre. You know, like one acre or two acres, and you're like, cool. It takes a long time to cut that grass. But yeah. go all the way out there, and you got 160 acres to to manage. Most of it, you know, you're probably not even managing. You just let the cows graze or let animals graze on it. So, yeah. And then number three, which is easy, they must file for a deed of title for the land. It's pretty easy. You know, you just live on it. You don't raise arms against the government, and you just file for a deed of title. Super easy to get this land. Okay. So, Gephardt and Paul Bender were coming from the east as they're immigrants, and has become the widely accepted theory that they were of German descent. Um, a lot of this is kind of uh, we've. I've been doing a lot of research to find exactly where they came from, but the consensus is that they're German descent. Paul Bender spoke almost no English and only spoke German, hence why they have German descent. <laughs> and the English he knew would only come out in grunts. So most of the time when he's talking to him, he's like, huh, huh, yeah, huh, huh, so, yeah, yeah. So anytime people would talk to him, he'd just grunt. And most of the time they ended up talking to Gephardt. Um, Gephardt was a much better speaker and spoke English well, but only with a tiny tiny German accent, so they still thought he was German, but he spoke really well in English. 
Gephardt was described by a townsperson as having a persistent giggle every time he talked, or almost like a hyena-like laugh. Yes. <laughs> if you can imagine just someone being deadly serious with you, quoting scripture, and then laughing almost like a hyena in a tiny German accent. But as for these enemies of mine, who did not want me to reign over them, bring them here and slaughter them before me. <laughs> oh, God, so love the world. <laughs> it was only forgotten, son. So whosoever believes in him, so get off of my goddamn yard! <laughs> <laughs> he had anger issues too, I imagine. So he oh, just uh, like went from like laughing through scripture to just yelling about getting off of his grass. Yeah, uh, that's how oh, I'm picturing no. it. I, I think you're you're completely right. Um, I also feel like if you ever seen the movie The Joker with Joaquin Phoenix, I I kind of imagine it a little like that. You know, just add that little bit of like persistent giggle. And a lot of people, especially the 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 townsperson that made that quote about him, and that was this was after making the quote after that they um they had done their crimes. Okay. So he said that he um it's it was normal for people in that day after the Civil War to have weird little quirks dealing with P- PTSD. And they call them like little corks of of, of PTSD, which it's is kind of really sad. So it's cute, but sad <laughs> that that was so normalized, you know, that that was like, oh, no, it's just the war did that to them. Yeah, so. he likes to just like beat front doors. It's like really weird. But yeah, yeah, normally when he comes, you can tell he's getting comfortable with you when he just goes up to your house and he just starts punching your front door. He's not mad at you or anything. Honestly, he <laughs> likes doors. Um, but yeah, he, he takes his aggression out on that. And small Canadian geese. It's it's a thing. Yeah, oh. but just figurines of geese. I don't know. I don't know how what was he doing in the war? He just <laughs> he just worked in the in the wood mill. He didn't actually fight. Yeah, it's a very <laughs> weird form of PTSD. <laughs> he hates that wood mill. But he loves the wood mill all at the same. Yeah. If well, you love it, hate it. Make it go away. That's a very German thing <laughs> to say. <laughs> Not that we don't love German people. We do. Great. We love you out there. Well, the two benders who did not introduce themselves as father and son seem to act a whole lot like father and son or like father and a son-in-law. So it was very weird that the guy explained it saying that he they, they never introduced themselves as father and son. They just introduced themselves. And... There is no uh, father, but the fatherland. We this, should know uh, this by now. <laughs> <laughs> and Gil is actually really great at German accents, so we we love it. it has nothing to do with my German roots. Oh, uh, nothing at <laughs> all. No, no. <laughs> but they t- well, they took some time to look around and find a claim that was suitable for them. <laughs> they found a piece of land immediately east of the two of two small hills on a farmland that was already owned by some other people. They originally wanted the farmland that was owned by those people, but obviously the the uh, tradesman was like, "You can't have that. <laughs> you got to go next door to them." <laughs> they originally wanted the land owned by a Polish family. Yeah, <laughs> but they settled for Eastern Kansas. <laughs> yes, yes, they did. Sorry. No, that's whole. We that's will be awesome. on this side of the Rhine. <laughs> Looks down. There's like a fucking split cantaloupe on the ground. That's a really bad joke. It's early. Sorry. <laughs> nah. uh, this side of Drum Creek, which you'll find out. They also wanted that. So they found a piece of land immediately east of the two small hills, and that was fed by a piece of water called ah, Drum Creek. Alps. Yeah. <laughs> the, the, the Alps. <laughs> a piece of water called Drum Creek. They particularly drew the line to grab an overgrown piece of Drum Creek so they could basically go into this, this office, and they were like, hey, we want this piece of land, but we want this extra piece of this of this creek because we know people are going to gather there. People are going to be traveling through the area, and these people are going to need shelter. This is just the most German shit I've ever heard. It, it's I know literally. they were out there fucking like going through it, like basically gritting everything off like it was one giant ass spreadsheet. And we yep. will have this one to the left of the cherry tree. I don't care if it was Washington's. It's ours now. Okay. <laughs> and then we're going to take this one and this one. And I would like this parcel over there. Could you just please leave? 
that Polish family like, smiling the horn, get out of my land. <laughs> <laughs> they were slowly yeah. encroaching on their land. <laughs> yeah. So they're no, it's like, okay. we we're can not have even this. Polish. We're Australian. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's just okay. So you can have this. So they built a small and very weird looking house for the area. So, of course. They used sandstone for the base of the cabin Whoa. and also built a deep, deep well for the water. Because uh, oh. obviously this time you have to build wells, part of it. Gebhardt set up the main cabin area and added a cellar to the house. Okay. Going to come in handy later. Well, uh, this yeah, episode, but though. in all fairness, <laughs> totally necessary back then. Totally for, like, necessary. Food preservation. Yeah. The house was designed as such. So I'm going to explain the house because it's part of the story for later. Walk me it's through. It's basically a modest, mm. symmetrical house of 16 by 24 feet and a oh. very small nine foot roof. And Okay. Which is for us, that's honestly like I look up and I'm like, my house is like 10 foot roof and it's, yeah, it's so small standard. to me. It's standard, yeah. but that's small to me. I'm like, man, like it's not yeah. much room. You can't you also like, drink yell. protein water. So like you're like ready to like, like busting through the roof. Yeah, you know? it's, it's like, an issue. I, like you have I like neck reach pains. my hand up and punch through the <laughs> yeah. and a neck piece. <laughs> yeah, you, you basically, every time you sneeze, you put another hole in the ceiling. Like you're just like, oh, pretty much. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's been it's, happening a lot lately, so. Yeah, <laughs> they set okay. up a, a trap door in the house to give access to the cellar from a inside the house. Okay, okay. So no, it wasn't no, a no. Trap it's very door. no. It's very necessary because it's after all, Kansas is freaking. I don't know if anyone's ever been to Kansas in the winter. <laughs> Kansas oh. is so so cold in the winter. Yeah, it snows a lot and and it just gets horribly cold. Also, well known for tornadoes. So very like, much so perfect. Yeah, you kind of want that like quick access to it. This, yeah. this makes sense. And honestly, sixteen by twenty four for like you know it's more or less a frontier house, right? <laughs> yeah, like, not it's bad, actually right? Pretty damn big. Mm-hmm. But yeah, just think of the land that they're on, and then think of this. If you were flying over top of it, and you just see this one style house, and I actually <laughs> did some research on houses out there. Mm-hmm. I, you know, you go into these crazy research holes when you're researching for stories and literally i looked at most of these uh houses in this area and most of them all are still on the 160 acre plot lands so they're still selling the same amount of lands in the area in cherryville and and so it's like never really changed much from what almost 200 years ago uh yeah like 109 160 years years. ago yeah yeah so pretty crazy damn so at the cabin used a big, heavy wagon canvas to separate out the room. Okay. So, which is, you know, makes sense because that's probably what they had. Yeah. So, and the room where the front door was located on one side of the canvas was a crude, a <laughs> <laughs> was a crude but sturdy walnut table with two long benches up on either side. You okay. know, the ones you can find in a barn style Airbnb that are popular now. Mm-hmm. With the sliding barn doors to separate the room. <laughs> it's just this long, long, <laughs> basically a dining table in the kitchen. Okay. So the kitchen was also on that side of the canvas. But on the other side of the canvas was the, well, basically horrible pallet beds made of straw. So they spent all their time on everything else, right? Yeah. And And I'm imagining, you know, wh- who would this be? Bender Jr. brought back that, like... That long um, table and bench on his back from working in the wood mill during the Civil War, um, exactly. which is totally made up history. But what isn't these days? Um, yeah. So like, so he carried these on his. You're back. just inferring. You're just yeah. inferring part of history. Yeah. Yeah. And beat the shit out of the front door, dropped it in there, mm-hmm. and then they just made wood pallet beds, which I'm yep. just straw thrown on top, right? Yep. A yep. little bit of token straw. Damn. Yep. Just enough for the lice to hang out. Literally. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it doesn't seem like they cared. So a lot of this is crazy because they 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 were making this an end. One of the biggest things that they wanted to do was make this an end for people traveling through the area because there was nothing else. They were like, about in the whole area. They were like 160 years, 170 years like ahead of their time. Because right now, yeah. like you brought up Airbnb, they could yep. have gotten top dollar for this now they're like yes look at how they rustic would've. it is don't you love it get away from the door look yeah. at how nice this is yeah and we have the bible scriptures on the wall and we have the geese the geese are back 
<laughs> yeah, the geese are back. It's, yeah, it's, it's just like a really frontier. Quirky. Yeah, it's just a quirky frontier Airbnb, honestly. We don't include Wi-Fi because we want people to talk. You know, we just want yeah. people to communicate. Well, by the end of 1871, the house slash inn was disgusting and filled with grime and smelled awful. Bugs were everywhere, and you could hear flies buzzing inside and all around the house. Okay. Outside of their house, they placed a sign that said, Grow Cries. What? Well, they didn't care that they spelled it wrong, because it was literally supposed to say groceries. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on. We're getting this as a shirt. <laughs> yes. It's a... Uh, they, they pretty much... <laughs> see Basically, grow cries. Yes. <laughs> grow cry. And they yeah. did, the, the two didn't care at all that they spelled it wrong. They were just like, eh, whatever. And people would come up to it and get Pardon. so disappointed that they didn't have any groceries. <laughs> they, you don't even have any grow cry. <laughs> yeah, they didn't have anything. And they're just like, whatever, it's fine. <laughs> so wait, hold on. They just put up a sign that said grow cries, trying to attract people for groceries, but they literally didn't have any groceries in this place. And it nope. was just a disgusting mess. Yes. It was basically a large outhouse at this point. Yeah, literally, yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So so their grow cries business isn't going so well. Not yet. Uh-huh. Not yet. Yeah. Okay. They're not there yet. Yeah. Okay. They're building, you know. They're just start, how many years family. are they into this? Is this like week one? Like how far are they? Well, so they got there in seventy I think they got there in seventy one. Okay. And so it's like not too long. It's maybe a couple months, but they've been there. So at that point that was about a year and a half. Okay. So I'm a, so it's not, they, they, they spent they've been all there their, for a good bit. Yeah. Yeah, but they spent all their time on like interior design and decorating. Yeah, they made it a nice little <laughs> a nice little raunchy Airbnb. I love it. Yeah, yeah. That's them there. Well gotcha. it's about to get spreeced up, okay? It's for crust punks that wanna go like, you know, retro and like yeah. go like farm aesthetic but still be a crust punk. I kinda like it. It's corky. It's like CBGBs, but like, you know, in the Wild West. For serial of. killers. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay, yeah. I'm into this. I feel like Sid Vicious would go there and write some albums. I think maybe people have. Or something. Yeah. yeah. So, in the spring of 1871, Kate Bender and Ma Bender arrived on Stagecoach, finally, coming from Independence, Missouri, which is where they're coming from. So, Ma Bender was also known by two names. That you know, she's been described as t- two other names, and I'm just gonna call her Ma-, Ma Bender. She was known as Almira with an A, and then Elvira with an E. So two different names that they said that was her name, but we're just gonna call her Ma Bender because I don't want to deal with having to which name is correct. So it's much gotcha. easier just to say that. Yeah. Okay. Ma Bender was described as a dirty old Dutch crone. Her <laughs> face was a fit picture of the midnight hag. That wove the spells of murderous ambition about the soul of Macbeth. <laughs> Real looker. Quotes from the town people are hilarious. <laughs> okay, yeah. let's hear him. Let's hear him. That was the quote from the townsperson. Oh, damn. <laughs> about okay. her. Yeah. They were freaking lit about that stuff, damn. honestly. Yeah. So, Kate, on the other hand, was a sight to behold. A man in town named Maurice Sparks later told reporters of the Topeka County Journal, which after the uh, after the murders, she was not a bad looking girl. <laughs> she had high cheekbones and auburn hair. That's all he said. That's all he said about her. <laughs> Basically, he had a crush on her for like a he week had a and then just like never did anything about it. And he just no. was embarrassed. Gotcha. Okay. I mean. Throughout all of this, everyone has a crush on Kate. So, I mean, okay. yeah, everyone has a crush on her. Everyone thinks they, you yeah. know, that everyone wants her. Every everyone come through town, but you know, you're living the American frontier life. Yeah, you know, young young women are few and far between. So. True, Joey. Do you have a crush on her? Uh, um, I mean, maybe. Okay. Yeah, I mean, she gets into some witchy stuff too, which is kind of cool. That's pretty um, cool. Yeah, we'll see. The only blemish she was known to have was a small scar underneath her left eye. 
<laughs> was a small Canadian goose that was fused <laughs> to her neck. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so she had a small blemish on her. So she was a little Just bit a like small, left tiny eye. Scar. Yeah. She was. She was like left eye. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I mean, <laughs> eventually won't do what left eye did. So. Oh. Do you remember left eye burned down the? Didn't she burn down her ex husband's house or burned? Maybe I'm thinking of the wrong person. I don't remember. Contact at blackcat.report if you know who this is. If you know what, who was the person that burned down their their boyfriend's house or ex-boyfriend's house. One of the benders, the probably. Group. Could be, yeah. Yeah. Well, she was well known to frequent the Sunday school classes with her brother Gebhardt. Okay. Well, brother in quotations is what I'll say. Um, though most people honestly thought their connection felt more like a husband and wife than a brother and sister. <laughs> <laughs> they were more in the line of a Jamie and Cersei Lannister style relationship than a Rob and Sansa Stark, if you get my meaning. Yes. Okay. If you ever watch Game of Thrones, that's <laughs> the part of it. They were Southern royalty. Got it. Yes. <laughs> she was known to wear a dress that would show her ankles when she sat in the pews at church. Harlot. I know. All the boys and men would try to sit within the eye line of her to get a gaze at her ankles when she'd sit down. Can you imagine such heresy showing your ankles at church i I know she was the devil incarnate i just can't afford tall socks (laughs) (laughs) i don't mean to do this (laughs) yeah no it's she she was looked on as as much more than just a uh, nice bible girl damn yeah well anyways let me get down from my soapbox and continue the story because you know we can see your ankles from judge there yeah yeah i know (laughs) The Benders had a home, and well, they wanted yeah. to rent it out and make a bit more money for themselves. So they already had the grow cries business going. Well, to be fair, they didn't have hard goods to sell, like I said earlier, which kind of pissed people off when they were going by and didn't see anything for sale. <laughs> and actually, which is even funnier, they finally, Kate and Mob Bender, fixed the sign to say groceries when, when they got there, so... Come on down to Bender's Grow Cries, where you can Grow find cries. anything and everything except anything. <laughs> yeah. Bender's Grow Cries needs to be a t-shirt, I think. We need to make that <laughs> merchandise. So Kate, of I'm... course, decided it was time to pick up a hobby. You know, as mm-hmm. you would in the out, you know, in in the outlands, you know, when you're out there doing nothing. I mean, so... she has all this free time after, you know, helping with the families uh in their highly successful Grow Cries store. And now she just she's just like, what do I do? What do I do? I'm I'm assuming she goes into modeling. So, with the full support of her family, which I mean, hey, who wouldn't like that, right? She starts a feet only OnlyFans. Um, she decides she was going to delve into spiritualism. Okay, same thing. Yeah, yeah, same same thing. Well, let me tell you what spiritualism is, if you don't know. And excuse me for my I'll always diatribes about history because I love history. I'm always here for it, but I want to explain it so we can understand, again, how things work. And if you don't know what spiritualism is, neither did I until I had to research it. So, obviously. Spiritualism is a belief that your soul is immortal. It's kind of Christianity, kind of on the side track of that, and can be contacted by people called mediums. The mediums are there to translate what you say to the person on the other side and then to you and vice versa. They communicate with the dead. We may know one person who did this and was destroyed for his fakeness in Crossing Over with John Edwards, if anyone remembers that show from like the 2000s. Classic documentary. Yeah, classic documentary. Well, I would like to preface this by saying that I don't not believe we have souls. And maybe there is another side or afterlife of where we go when we die. But I mean, I just don't know. And if you know more or want to tell me more, please hit us up at contact at blackcat.report. If you completely hate my description of it, please email us at haters at blackcat.report. I won't read it, but I'll know you sent it. I will, and it'll make me sad at night. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Gil, usually sad at night, so. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. I did, I did want to throw in there, because I have to, and my mom, my mom would, uh, be sad if I didn't include so um yeah spiritualism especially around like this time what was called spiritualism which obviously like terms and meanings and loose categories change over time right um spiritualism was huge 
at this point in time, and it actually did, you know, it went up and down in popularity, and this lasted up until, honestly, the early 1900s. So one of the huge reasons why there was such an uptick in spiritualism, specifically at this time, is because there were so many widows from the yep. Civil War mm-hmm. um, that the practices which kind of got like picked up from like Europe from uh, let's just say like high class folks like in Europe who would mm-hmm. actually have like entire spiritual like I forget what the fuck the term is damn it but it was normal at the time for new houses and cities and stuff to actually have like an entire parlor an entire room yep. just dedicated to spiritual practices and they would have mediums come over and that's where you have all the stuff with like crystal balls and like um, ectoplasm, like goo and mm-hmm. all this crap like that coming along. In reality, you had a long history of complete like charlatans and like con men and women like coming in and just like traveling around, tricking people and doing all sorts of crazy stuff. Yep. Um, but it was an accepted form of entertainment. Like, and it was something that at the time, um, I think just because so many people were in despair about like missing members of their family or having, yeah. I don't know, their entire family wiped out where it's just like a woman yep. where it's like all three of my sons and my fucking husband died in that war. And now I'm just like living on the edge of town and I'm fucking lonely. Yeah. Um, you know, there wasn't a lot of pushback from most churches, like even in the deep South against spiritualism. It wasn't like, oh, that's the devil's work. It was just like, oh, it's a way to talk to souls, which we all believe exist, mm-hmm. right? Like everybody passes over, da 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 There's stories about angels, so on and so forth. It's not weird that there might be some form of communication. This is also at a time when like electricity getting real big um, mm-hmm. and like science is making like huge, huge leaps. So the idea that there might be some sort of scientific basis behind communicating with folks in the next world is like, not crazy when you're having such a boom in technology and all of a sudden everything feels possible. Um, but yeah, spiritualism has a lot of crazy practices that go with it. Um, and yeah, it's changed a lot. So when he's referring to spiritualism, he's not talking about spiritualism now. He's talking about spiritualism during the slash 1800s. like immediately post civil war in the United States, which had its yep. own interesting mutations. That's my rant. And, and- and thinking about it too is that like it's so interesting that folk magic and like the and religion coexisted and like Christianity mm-hmm. coexisted so well at this time. Even thinking about, you know, going from the Salem witch trials where they had folk magic, they all used the same thing and most of them weren't killed for it. So it's it's super interesting to understand that like what is looked on nowadays and kind of demonized nowadays from Christianity's side of it was actually practiced side by side a lot of the time during the 1800s, the 1700s, 1600s of folk magic. It was also hot off the heels of plenty of different types of appropriation um, Mm -hmm. as Christians would like come into areas and be like, you're not allowed to practice that anymore and like bang them over the head and be like, but you can basically do the exact same thing if you move it from winter solstice on the 21st to the 24th and the 25th, which is like yeah. our Lord's birthday. Um, like hey. now you can practice all your pagan rituals. And it's like, there's only a couple hundred years after they really like started that in parts of Europe, right? Yep. It's like a few hundred years. So that, especially with like the way culture and stuff like that, like changed so slowly at the mm-hmm. time, um, that you know, this is still very fresh. So yeah, a lot of the like the the magic, right? And like the folk yeah. magic and stuff like mm-hmm. that it was actually not weird because it was Christians trying to kind of infect what was already existing in the cultures. It wasn't vice yep. versa. You yeah. know. It was like, yeah, this is, you still had, you know, and like the, the incredibly inappropriate term, but you still had like tribes of gypsies quote unquote you know like traveling around like doing magic like in like Romania and like all over the area and they were bringing practices that Christians tried to snuff out weren't able to snuff out and just kind of continued um yeah don't know where I'm going with that rant but honestly it's a lot closer to what shit already was that's what I'm trying to yeah yeah no agree well here was Kate getting into her new hobby she would take tours around the town and give speeches about spiritualism. And also a rather scandalous notion, like she was straight out of the 1970s. That's right. She preached about free love. Oh, my God. I know. Ankles and, and all. The, 
she was a hundred years before their t- before her time. So this helped her gain quick notoriety, especially with the male spiritualist, who I'm sure wanted to free her spirit. <laughs> <laughs> now, she wasn't the only one in town preaching about spiritualism and practicing it. Glenn. There are four other families that started doing this. And as it was something new happening in, in the 1870s, Julia Hessler was one of the women who worked in town. And she was also doing a lot of these seances as well. So she was pretty tall for the time, just being under six foot. This is Julia Hessler. She's about, uh, just under six foot, which is God damn, for she's a woman. like four foot two. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah. For, for being a woman at the time, she was pretty tall. And even, I guess, nowadays. Well, yeah. She traveled alone most of the time because she wanted to prove that she could fend for herself. You know, she was like, I'm tall. I want to do it for myself. I don't want anyone protecting me. She had so many offers from men being like, excuse me, ma'am, let me walk you home. And she's like, nah, I get it. I got this. I'm taller than you. (laughs) I'm taller than you. (laughs) I know it's just two men in a trench coat. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah. Damn it. She got us. Yep. Well, Kate and Julia met when Kate worked at the hotel when she was a waitress in late 1871. So Kate got a job as a waitress as well because she was looking to bring in some more money because obviously their grow cries business was not booming and their end business is not, uh, they haven't got all the reviews they needed for Airbnb yet. Nobody comes to our grow cry store or <laughs> are out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this place sucks. <laughs> yeah. Kansas sucks. So Kate invited her to the cabin for a seance as Julia had got swept up in the spiritualism wave. Okay. Julia had decided she was going to spend the night at the cabin, so she took a stagecoach instead of her horse. Okay. So that night, as she approached the cabin, she noted how the cabin pretty much blended in with the landscape and almost the shoddiness of it, you know, kind of like it was just an outhouse and not a... Actual okay. inn. <laughs> yeah. So as she walked into the house, Kate was alone, creating the circle. So Julia was to be nice to her. She sat down face to face with Kate. Mm-hmm. And and her back was to the curtain, the stage coast curtain in the house. Okay. So she could Julia could see flies and smell a horrible stench coming from the below the house. But she just said, Yeah, it's fine. It's like an <laughs> It's an outhouse. Who knows? <laughs> yeah. So she took a little tiny glance behind the curtain. Like she flipped the curtain back and just kind of looked and a stench wafted over her. And Ooh. she saw a horde of flies just buzzing around the back of that. She kind of just <laughs> took a peek back into their shoddy, crappy beds. And was like, <laughs> ugh, that's disgusting. Yeah. As Kate started the seance... And the whispers grew louder, so Kate was just, you know, getting into it like, pss, 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 <laughs> doing whatever they say in a seance of that, <laughs> which I don't know I didn't research into, but <laughs> Julia opened her eyes and saw right behind Kate was Paul Bender, Gebhardt, and Ma Bender standing there in the dark. Pa Bender holding something that gleamed in the light. She said she couldn't really perceive what it was but it looked very odd Julia said excuse me I have to go relieve myself and then kind of shuffled her way out the door as they barely let her out the door as she stepped out of the door she started to run like hell and she got to the tall grass she heard gunshots and bickering among the Bender family as they were running after her. She tripped and fell near a rock that was about 70 feet from the house. She hid behind it for a second. She could hear the bickering getting closer. And Julia looked for something else to hide behind. But knowing she had to run, she picked up her skirt and booked it out of there. She could hear gunshots behind her and yelling. She tripped over a rock that was so large she was able to hide behind it? No, she looked for another rock. Oh, okay. She, it was like, a, <laughs> yeah, like, no, she looked for another rock what to hide she... behind. God damn. No. no. Okay, so this yes. is like this is like straight up Hills Have Eyes scenario, right? Yeah. Okay. yeah. She could hear gunshots behind her and yelling. 
She had made it out, but just barely. Okay. With the rotten smell still in her nose, Ugh. she ran literally until the sun came up, and she just made it to a friend's homestead as the morning light shine up over the hill. Why didn't she take a horse? Because, remember, she had planned to stay the night. Yeah, but, but she took She had a... planned to stay the night, so she took a stagecoach. Oh, so a stagecoach dropped her off. A stagecoach then... dropped her off oh, to the house because okay. she was like, hey, I, I trust Kate. I've met her. And yeah. they had done seances together before, so I want to reiterate that. They had done seances gotcha, gotcha, at other gotcha, places gotcha, gotcha. and at the hotel. Okay, because so I just trusted pictured her. Like, her horse there the whole time. I'm like, why didn't you? No. Okay. No. And gotcha. so, you know, think about it, though. She's running across 160 acres of, like, Hell. into to another homestead, the next-door homestead, to get to them. Yeah. So she is wrecked tired yeah. and barely escapes this house. I'm... I guess they just the the vendors just like the way you know the hunt because yeah. you know they didn't the thrill you know, the kill the yeah. thrill the kill because she survived so yeah. survived okay. to tell her story well okay. nothing came of it because well but, no one was hey. killed and no one was murdered okay she didn't tell anybody until afterwards that's how her story was told so one big cover for the benders was they lived okay. in an area hey. that was known for horse thieves and outlaws. And after all, this was the burgeoning West. Most of all, the murders and disappearances were blamed on the outlaws. So the murders and disappearances got so bad in this town, they formed a vigilance committee. So they formed their own town watch, is what the vigilance committee became. <laughs> the town watch would take over arresting people and interrogating people. So by vigilance, you mean vigilante. Yeah, like, literally vigilante. Gotcha. They call okay. themselves Vigilance Committee, but they're vigilante. There's a better ring to it. I like that. Some good I like branding. the Vigilance Committee, yeah. It's 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 a little bit more we're watching over you more than, you know, we're a secret we're not, society. We're not vigilantes. No, no, no. We're just uh, vigilant citizens. We're yes. actually a group of nannies. We are we are vigilant <laughs> citizen nannies. We're vigilant nannies. That's what yep. we are. There we go. That's what we are. And we, you know, we we love to shop local. We get all of our stuff from the Grow Cries down the street. <laughs> um, you know, we like to stay over at the out when we have the long days in. Uh, yep. Yeah. Yeah, pretty I much. That's exactly. That. No, that's pretty <laughs> much what they did. It's too early. <laughs> well, for the most part, the outlaws and horse thieves, in quotations, who were captured, would eventually be set free because, well, they, for the most part, had no evidence they had done murdering of the people uh. or... You know, and as we might know, there was a certain family that had a hand in it. Oh. And here's where we get into the murders by the benders. Midas. Yeah. They're not even there for, I think they're there for a year, year and a half, two years before they start. So at least recorded ones. Yeah. So in October of 1872, two brothers set off with their fishing equipment to Drum Creek. Both of them had a day off and were ready to catch a few fish to eat for lunch and dinner. They approached a thicket right off the creek. And as the older boy went into the thicket, the younger boy noticed some rags on the thicket. This wasn't like an abnormal thing on the frontier. So, but he looked closer at the rags and then noticed there was another shirt hanging in the thicket. Kind of a shirt that, you know, the older boy would have worn is what the younger boy said. The younger boy called out to his brother, and his brother stared into the stream. The older boy was staring at a dead body laying in the stream. Both of them decided they would rather tell the sheriff and their father. So they ran off and did. The boy grabbed the dress just to show the, his father to make sure that they believed him that, that you know, wasn't just some young boy being like, oh my God, did you see the, you know, poking dead bodies in the, you know, he wanted his father to believe, okay, there's actually dead people here, so come with us. So after they told him, the father went and got a coroner and got a sheriff. So the coroner arrived to take a look at the body. When he flipped it over, they could see that the man's skull was crushed and his throat was slit open. Oh, okay. Yeah. So obviously... It's not, he just didn't die it, out there. It was there a suicide, yeah. It, it's obviously. a suicide, yes, yes. Yeah. In Drum Creek. So, okay. 
they eventually found out who he was through an ad that the coroner put in the paper with his description. Because he didn't have any identifying papers, he didn't have any money, he didn't have anything. He was sadly identified by his wife, who yeah, yeah. saw the newspaper after her husband had been gone for too long. He was headed out to help finish building a school because he Damn. was trying to pay off the money he borrowed to help build the school. I, yeah, I, this is a good guy that's like, well, now he's dead. So shit. the Benders were not good people as much as uh, people wanted to hit on Kate. His wife was left with their children, broke, and now in debt. Aww. The death was eventually blamed on a man named R.M. Bennett, who owned and farmed the land he was found on. So that part of Drum Creek was owned by R.M. Bennett. Um, the vigilance committee, <laughs> the vigilantes, <laughs> visited the site of the death and noticed there were tracks where the body was dumped. There, it was a wagon, wagon wheels, a track of wagon wheels. So the wagon had a unique feature, which they found out there being little detectives. The wagon had a back wheel that was dished the wrong way. So it was basically like put on the wrong way. And gotcha. it made a weird noise. The wheel did because it was also overloaded frequently and heavily and never changed. So the back wheel of it was just running weird because they put it on first wrong. And then also they just put so much heavy stuff on this uh, on this wheel that eventually it like changed its pitch. So it was definitely different than normal Game tracks. Track. They did the research and found out that R.M. Bennett did not have a wagon like that. So he was eventually cleared of the charges, and as the leads ran dry, they couldn't find anybody that was at fault for it. So they just let it go. So they basically just went up to his house. And they, Do you have a wagon with a squeaky wheel? And he's like, no, <laughs> I swear. <laughs> what is this oil can doing here? I was Sheesh. drinking it. Ah. Yeah. Well, yeah. got the wrong man, boys. Sorry. <laughs> I mean, this time there's really not much else they can do. Like, they don't have DNA evidence. They didn't have a lot of else to go on. Plus, they weren't also trained. They weren't, you know, like the Pinkertons. You know, the Pinkertons, I yeah. think, were at this time were like the the big detectives in this area and scared a lot of people, be yeah. scared a lot of outlaws because they were the, the company that would search for everybody. So they didn't, you know, at this moment, it could have just been, you know, somebody was murdered, but it could have been the, out the in quotations, outlaws and horse thieves mixed in with bad company and then really wasn't much they could do so they kind of just let it go yeah well in november and december of 1872 three different men at three different times went missing as they all went on their way to independence kansas they're looking to find some new land for their families and themselves so ben brown wf mccrofty and henry mckenzie <laughs> henry mckenzie who is <laughs> His nieces and nephews later called him Hank. <laughs> I love were McCroft. all murdered. Yeah. Oh, oh no, yeah. damn it. They were all murdered. These bodies were all found in an apple orchard on the Bender's property. That was also found out later. So, getting the worst of it, Henry McKenzie's body was mutilated and split up into different areas. So, I do want to 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 make you guys understand too is like a lot of these people don't have a lot of what happened to them because. We didn't have DNA. They didn't. Nobody went back and retraced the steps of these people. So these three people were just found murdered and were found attributed later to the Benders. So just the little extra. So in December of 1872, in a homestead south of Independent, Kansas, a man named George Lonker was making preparations to go to Iowa. It was starting to get cold, and he wanted to do the trip earlier due to it being warmer the week before. This man was a blacksmith and he was very much in demand at that time because everybody wanted blacksmiths to get whatever they're doing with their wagons, you know, getting some, you know. Have you guys heard of metal? It's like really cool. You can like <laughs> do all these things with it. Yeah. Gotcha. I don't know if he was German though. Good he enough. probably was. Yeah. He and his wife had arrived in Kansas in 1870. Mary Jane, his wife, was skilled in the garden as well as she was loved in the community, of course. I bet you Mary Jane was skilled <laughs> in the garden and loved the community. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Mary Jane. They had a little boy who was around eight years old. In May of 1870, their little boy grew pale and started coughing. 
Sorry. His little cheeks turn red. He sent for a doctor, and the doctor diagnosed it as lung disease. And he soon after he passed away. I don't know oh, why you're laughing dude. at this poor little boy being killed. Mary Jane's, Mary Jane's son turned pale. I know. He started coughing. I know. It's very. It's it's very ironic. It's on brand. But it's sad. It oh is, yeah, yeah, but he died. But there was like so he many died. people that died. Also, everybody from this time is dead. Everyone. That's true. Yeah, that's true. So the family obviously was very destroyed by this. Mm. But again, like we're just saying, it sadly wasn't abnormal in the homesteading life. Uh-uh. So most children did not live past adolescence, and most women spent years pregnant, which is just, I cannot imagine that. Uh-uh. Just being constantly pregnant year after year because they have to keep coming kids come in, they have to, to, to work the farms, to work the homestead lives, and because most children don't live past being a child. They they die, so they don't actually get adults most of the time. So they have basically, it's you know ratios. They're just like, how many kids can we have? Because we know about 50, 70 percent of them are going to die. So Mary Jane became pregnant again, and then gave birth on January twelfth, eighteen seventy one. Mary Ann was born. So they didn't, you know, very much easier just to name them the same, almost the same. This was a joyous occasion for both, but sadly. Less than a week later, Mary Jane passed away because of complications from childbirth. Uh-huh. Yeah, this guy George just can't can't win. It sounds like Keanu Reeves to me, honestly, because Keanu Reeves had his wife die and then his child die in like almost in the same week. Because uh-huh. yeah, it's pretty crazy. So yeah, George man. remained in the homestead for about a year without Mary Jane. You know, he was just. Raising Marianne because he's, you know, this is what he did. He was a single father now. So, in the early hours of a cold December week of 1872, going back to the future where we are, George said his goodbyes to his neighbors, one of whom he purchased a team of horses from, and he headed off on the trail. I do want to say that is an important note for the future because the man that he purchased his horses from. We'll come into the story later. So as he made his way through the Kansas cold, he pulled up to Bender's home to escape the cold for a night and buy some supplies because he wanted some grow grease. Uh, yeah. As normal, Kate and Gebhardt greeted them as they rode up. Okay. George and his 18-month-old Mary Ann purchased some supplies. Apparently at this time they had some supplies. It was very weird that they said this in the story. So got I a, guess he purchased a little a bit. They maybe had some food. Yeah, but we have a pile of flies. <laughs> yeah, hmm, and they I'll inquired I'll about staying the night at the out slash in. This is one of the <laughs> fanciest outs I've ever seen. <laughs> so Caden Gebhardt agreed and invited them in. George walked into the house and immediately could see and hear the flies buzzing around, but That's thought like it's still better than being cold <laughs> on the outside. Yeah. <laughs> Obviously, how, how is it? How is it winter and their house is still filled with flies? I have no idea because like it's, they are you know, trying to keep these flies alive actively. I mean, they are actively they're, they're doing... trying to keep these flies. It is December in Kansas. Yep, and their house is still infested with flies. Like, yep, damn. Yeah, it's pretty bad. This is impressive. Have to be a horrible smell. So they should have just became one of those shitty ass like highway zoos. Come oh, see yeah. the dancing flies. The survivable you know. flies. <laughs> yeah. So he sat down on the bench with Marianne, and with Kate on the other side, he noticed the draped canvas hanging down to separate the living quarters. What's that? Right? Yeah. What's, <laughs> what's, what's over there? Kate told George that she was a spiritualist and could talk with the dead. Which I mean, uh, this yes, is probably the wall. hook line That's in That's because Sinker I'm a spiritualist. <laughs> <laughs> well. <laughs> She said that in a matter of fact thing. And and <laughs> honestly, George just had lost his wife and his son like a year or two before. Yeah. So he's like, oh, yes, great. I would love that. This is like a great perk being here with yeah. this, this inn, you know, like, yeah, you guys, you're in shitty. But man, I get to maybe talk to my wife and, you know, my deceased wife and my my kid that just died. Yeah. Like, yeah, let's let's do this. Let's do it. Do you this know? thing. Yeah. Yeah. So. Kate lit some candles and started the seance. His eyes firmly set upon Kate as she started speaking to spirits, all the while not noticing the wind howling outside 
and Marianne getting restless. His eyes intent on Kate, the lights dimmed a tiny bit, and the curtain behind Kate moved just a little bit and unveiled three others standing in the dark. Kate kept speaking, and then with another flicker of the candlelights, boom! And that is where we'll leave off for next week in the conclusion of the Bender Family Part 2. Hell Thank yeah, you all man. for listening. We'll see you next week. Yes, yeah, see y'all next week. Bye. Thank you so much for listening to the Black Cat Report in our episode 65 on the Benders, American Frontier Serial Killer Family Part 1. The book we used for this episode was Hell's Half Acre by Susan Jonasis. Please rate and review us wherever you get your podcasts. And we'll be back next week with part two of the series. So we'll see you on the other side.